Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. You know, it's hard for grown-ups, and I'm sure it's even harder for kids, to kind of understand what resurrection, what Jesus' resurrection is all about. We read that he was crucified, and he died, and they buried him in a tomb. And then, on Sunday morning, when people went to see him in the tomb, the tomb was empty. Jesus wasn't there. But when Mary stooped to look in and was crying because she couldn't find him, there he was right behind her. He was alive. It's hard to really understand that. There really is no good explanation. But sometimes God provides examples in nature that help us understand it at least a little bit. And a really good example, I think there are pictures on, yeah. A really good example is the caterpillar. We've all seen caterpillars, right? See them in our yard all the time. They like to eat the leaves off my rose bushes. Well, a caterpillar spins a cocoon, and eventually the caterpillar is inside the chrysalis. Can't see the caterpillar anymore. It's as if the caterpillar is just gone. It is no more. And it stays like that for a while. It doesn't move. It just stays inside that chrysalis. But then one day, time is up, and the caterpillar begins to change into a butterfly. And when it leaves the chrysalis, it is a butterfly. And it just flies away. No more caterpillar. Instead, we have a beautiful butterfly. And I suspect, as you've sort of been anticipating, I need a parent for each kid, because these packets can be a little tricky to open, and you mustn't mash them. You want to come up and get one? Here's one for everybody. And let mom or dad or whoever is with you help you open it so that it doesn't get mashed. And there are, there are plenty left over. If an older kid would like to come up and join in the fun, I've got several left in here. And they all do need to be opened at some point today. Okay. That's fine. Anybody else want one? Yeah, the plan isn't that they crawl on the floor first. He will, he will when he wakes up enough. <laughs> yeah, they'll exercise their wings a little bit, and eventually... Whee! Can you, can you pick it up? Come here, buddy. There we go. Now, if you take him over to the flowers, 
and sort of toss it just a little bit, they'll hop onto the flowers. And then in the middle of my sermon, they'll start flying all around the sanctuary. <laughs> Okay, kids, let's get together and have a prayer. Well, that one doesn't want to go. Here, you want me to help you with it? Hers, hers flew away. Well, that is a nanny. I think if you just lay it over here, it'll be okay, Noel. Okay. Okay, we need to gather together, kids, and have a prayer because you have something more special coming for the rest of us. Okay, okay, Noel, let's put him, if we sort of give him a toss. There, he'll enjoy that flower. All right, let's have a prayer together, and then you have something special for us. Okay, ready to pray? Lord, thank you for the fun of kids. And thank you that we are never too old to have fun like kids have fun. Thank you especially for the joy of resurrection, the joy that comes from your resurrection, and the opportunity that you give us through examples in nature to enter into that joy and excitement. Help us never to forget it. Help us always to remember that when times are really dark, we can reach down and remember the joy of your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lift your name on high, Lord, I love to sing your praises, I'm so glad you came my life, I'm so glad you came to save us.
thank you, Up Count Chorus. That was a very nice, special treat for us all. It takes kids to remind us that at heart we're all kids and to show us how we ought to enjoy life as kids enjoy life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the joy of this morning. Help us to carry it with us always. In the midst of the joy, let us not get so caught up in the emotion that we don't see and hear the message that you have for each of us. Because every Easter, we are different people. And you have a special message for each of us. Open our eyes and open our ears to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to this glorious day of Easter, not only by way of Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, but also by way of a year forever branded COVID-19. We can say in all honesty that we are very much acquainted with suffering and sorrow and death and grief. So if we sing our praises a little bit more jubilantly this morning than perhaps we have done in years past, maybe it's because we know that it is our faith that has brought us through this past year and that the bedrock of our faith is Jesus' resurrection. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I didn't hear that. He is risen. He is risen indeed. It is not the re-reading of these ancient words that calls forth our thanks and our praise, but rather it is our lived experience of knowing the presence of Jesus in our lives and in the lives of people all over the world that calls for that jubilation. As we hear again the account of Jesus' resurrection, we not only rejoice that Jesus stood near Mary as she stood at his tomb, we rejoice because Jesus stands near us as we stand or kneel at the graves of those we have loved and lost. So here again, the account of Jesus' resurrection as told in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. 
Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni. Jesus said, do not hold me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. This is the word of the Lord. It is not hard to imagine that Mary had not had much sleep that Sabbath night, waiting until the Jewish Sabbath was over at midnight on Sunday morning, she possibly headed for the tomb one minute past midnight, believing that the closest to Jesus that she could come would be at his tomb, she went to where she knew Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had laid Jesus' body. Like many of us know from experience, Mary also knew that just being at the gravesite is the closest that you can be to the one you have lost, and there's a modicum of comfort in being as close as you can. Who among us would not feel deep inner pain to arrive at the gravesite and find it open and the body of our loved one not there? We would not cry silent tears and I doubt that Mary's tears were silent. You see, up to this point, Jesus' death was like all of the other deaths that Mary had experienced in her life, and she fully expected Jesus' body to be in that tomb. Finding no body, she suspected what we would expect under those circumstances, Grave robbers had been there, and they had stolen the body of Jesus. The moment that thought occurred to her was simultaneously the moment that life on earth, as it had been known since the dawn of time, ended. It wasn't that the grave had been robbed of Jesus. Jesus had robbed the grave of death. Jesus was alive. Being grief-stricken and panicked, Mary did not notice that the men in the tomb were angels. She simply answered their question explaining that she was distraught because someone had taken her Lord and she didn't know 
where the body was, still bending down to look in the tomb, she became aware that there was someone standing behind her. But in the dark, she couldn't tell who it was. Could have been a Roman soldier. But she, in her current mental state, was simply concerned about finding where Jesus' body had been placed with a single word probably uttered just above a whisper. A gigantic stone was moved away from Mary's sight and from the sight of the whole world. Mary. Jesus was alive. Although that reality began in a moment of time, it is a reality that has no end. The depth of meaning in that reality can never be plumbed until Jesus returns to earth. The most fearsome power known to humankind is the power of death. It is inexorable, final, and an everlasting end to life. Jesus stood there, living proof that God overpowers death. The Creator God is a God of life, not death. Life is stronger than death. The power of death cannot overcome the power of life. And human beings who want to think that they can use death to make themselves more powerful are utterly powerless in the face of the never-ending life that God gives. In God's hand, death is part of the process of life. God uses death creatively to transform life. The caterpillar ceases to be a caterpillar. But out of the loss of the life as caterpillar, God creates a butterfly. Acorns cease to be acorns. But out of the death of the acorn, God creates an oak tree. Out of the loss of youthful exuberance, impulsivity, and spontaneity, God brings forth thoughtful wisdom to those of advancing years. There's always new life that is born out of a loss of part of our life or out of the loss of the earthly life of someone. Out of grief is born an awareness of a new way of living, a newness of life. I wonder what would have happened if Mary had not gone to that tomb and had time to weep. Certainly it would have not changed the fact that Jesus was alive, nor would it have prevented the whole world from knowing that Jesus is alive. But it would have prevented Mary from having the experience that healed her grief. Mary's tears of grief kept her from recognizing the angels. It didn't keep her from recognizing 
Jesus. Tears of grief give us direct communication with God. They express a pain and an emptiness that only God can understand. They express a pain and emptiness that only Jesus can comfort. As Mary found out, knowing that life is victorious over death not only relieves our sadness, but also gives us who remain in this life a new way of being in this life. There is new purpose, new meaning to life. There are new relationships and new goals. There are new relationships with people we have never known before. There is a new way of relating to people we have known for a long time. Most especially, there is a new relationship with God. There is a new way of thinking about the loved one we have lost. We come to realize that although that loved one is no longer here on earth with us, that doesn't mean the loved one has ceased to be. As followers of Jesus the Christ, we believe deep in our spirits that the day will come when we will experience the resurrection of our bodies as the body of Jesus was resurrected. He was not a newly created, different person. He was Jesus of Nazareth and the Son of God, resurrected. So, where does this leave all of us, this Easter day, 2021? First and foremost, it means that our Lord is a living Lord. We can experience his presence in our lives just as Mary experienced his presence in her life just at the moment she needed him the most. Jesus knows each of us by name, and he knows what we need to comfort us. Perhaps most importantly, we know that the power of death over us is not as strong as the power of life. Death may claim a form of life, but it cannot make life itself end. God gives life that death cannot overcome. That goes for each of us in this sanctuary, and it goes for all those we've loved and lost a while. It goes for all those who are thoughtlessly, inhumanely killed by other people, and it goes for all of those who succumbed to some microscopic organism. Jesus' resurrection does not change the natural order of life on earth. Death and loss still characterize our existence. What Jesus' resurrection does change is our awareness that physical life is not all the life there is. It is but one iteration 
of life. As one way of life ends, the next begins. As we stand or kneel at the place where we have buried those we've loved and those who have loved us deeply, we know that Jesus' prayer, that they would be with him where he is, has been answered. But we also know that the unity we had with those we loved while they were here with us, a unity in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit remains. That unity is one that we know deep within our being where God gives us life that death cannot overcome. We don't understand that life and that unity. And try as we might, we never will. We'll never be able to figure it out. We simply know that it is true. For death that would cut us off from God has been defeated. We don't need to know how and why that happened. We don't need to know how Jesus was resurrected. We simply need to love and praise God for making us aware deep in ourselves that Jesus is alive. We go forth into the rest of our lives to live in that reality and to listen in our dark moments for Jesus to call our name and to hear in the calling of our name the love that Jesus has for all of us. For Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. To God be the glory. Amen. Let us stand and say what we believe using a portion of the Second Helvetic Confession. Christ is truly risen from the dead. We believe and teach that the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his true flesh, in which he was crucified and died, rose again from the dead, and that not another flesh was raised other than the one buried, or that a spirit was taken up instead of the flesh, but that he retained his true body. Therefore, while his disciples thought they saw the Spirit of the Lord, he showed them his hands and feet, which were marked by the prints of the nails and wounds, and added, See, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. Our next song is The Day of Resurrection.
You may be seated. <clears throat> 